Assalamualaikum, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Scope here on British Muslim TV with me, your host, Wafar Rizvi. Uh, we're going to be, of course, discussing another hot topic of this week. But just to let you know, as always, the numbers at the bottom of your screen, you can certainly send in your comments or questions to those numbers uh, during the show as well. We are being broadcast live on satellite as well as throughout various BMTV social media channels as well. Now, the death of Queen Elizabeth II has sparked conversations about British as well as other countries' colonial history, as well as the, the modern day effects of that colonialism. Now, those who support the monarchy say Elizabeth's reign ushered in independence for many former British colonies. That is, of course, a fact, and that her influence over British government activities, especially overseas, was limited due to the constitutional monarchy in the UK. So she cannot then be held responsible is the argument for colonialism as such. Now, for critics on the other side, just the fact that she willingly went along with representing an institution such as the British royal family, with all the historical atrocities around the world attached to its name, is enough to condemn her. From Africa to South Asia and others, colonialism has had disastrous effects, which still linger. And to discuss that issue a bit further, we're not joined by Judical Eric Jose, who is a multi-award winning Afro-political feminist and social entrepreneur. And we're also joined by Jason Hansfall, who is a journalist at the Africa Report. Jason and Judah Kyle, thank you both for taking your time out of your very busy schedules to, to join us today here in the scope on British Muslim TV. Uh, Judah Kyle, I'd like to start with you, if I may, and just wanted to ask how you reflect on the arguments and the debate that is now occurring over colonialism, um, its history, as well as its modern day effects ever since Queen Elizabeth's death. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, can you repeat the question? I think you were breaking. You said how do sure. I reflect to... Sure, yes. How do, how do, you, how do you reflect on you know, the, the legacy of colonialism, especially in the wake of Queen Elizabeth's death? Um, you know, the most interesting part is that um, Queen Elizabeth died a day after one of the survivors of the Mai Mai Rebellion, a very old woman was doing an interview on BBC asking that the British um, government, the British Empire, the British monarchy gets to pay reparations towards her. So we literally have a survivor that went through the violence, crime that were committed against Kenyan still alive. And she died during that week where her video was going viral on the internet. Um, so yeah. Colonialism is still with us, you know, it's, it's, it's alive with us. These are stories we inherited from our parents. These are tales we grew up hearing. These are generational trauma that we live with. So we can't get over it because it's part of our life. We breathe it, we see it, we exist with it. And Queen Elizabeth, yeah. unfortunately, her death was a trigger, you know, a reminder that, oh my God, this is someone who had so much power to end all this uh, crimes that were committed through all these countries, even pay reparations, but she has died without doing so, even without apologizing. And that that that's what the trigger was about. Many people were angry that she gets to just die without any recognition to the violent crimes mm. that the British monarchy has committed. Jason, you know, the, the argument on the other side, and I said this in my introduction, is the fact that um, by the time the queen became the queen, uh, the UK was already a constitutional monarchy, uh, that her control over government decision making was limited from day one already. Um, what do you make of that argument in, of course, the context of colonialism? And we can talk about events in Kenya, certainly in Nigeria, that happened during her reign. I think it's a it's a complicated system. Obviously, um, you know, she she does have an extreme influence, but you know, we have a prime minister, we have a government which makes most of the decisions. Um, however, I do think as a symbol, uh, it, it would it was extremely important that she, I suppose, and the institution, the establishment, should have made apologies, especially you know, with contemporary travesties like the Windrush scandal. Um, that was the situation when, when so many people in the Commonwealth who came here. Um, as completely legally were sent back um, to countries they hadn't been to since they were children, and many of them died. And it's that legacy of colonialism which we see today, and, and I think that needed to at least have some apologies before, you know, conversations of things like reparations. Um, and I think it's been a complete shock to the country. Um, it's been interesting to watch the schism that, that's formed in, in the society today. You know, we have people queuing for hours um, to see her coffin, and then we have many people who are outraged 
um, by the establishment as a symbol of violence and genocide and the legacy that that, that leaves behind. Yeah, um, I wonder, Judica, what you make of the argument as well that I just put to Jason about the fact that uh, within the constitutional monarchy, her her you know her role was limited, right, and her her influence over government decision making was limited, even when it came to, of course, foreign policies or foreign action. Um, I think I would disagree. I think she had so much power because one of the first things she did when she became the queen was to tour all these countries, these former, former colonies, to try to make peace. And remember, when she ascended into power, there was a lot of organizing around independence. Um, that is what was happening in Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, all these countries left and right. And also she came into power where British, the British monarchy had already lost India. So the tour that she did on the African continent was trying to salvage what she can as a queen. So I would disagree, she was not just a symbol, she was an active participation in towards the stand the monarchy, which was all these former colonies. And of course, she did all she could to stop the rising of anti-colonial, um, to stop the, the rising of anti-colonial movement. And, and just to say that she was a symbol, it, it also brings the people who say, but all these African countries received their independence during Queen Elizabeth, trying to take it away that these movements were movements that were shot on, movements that were targeted by British police, movements that were tried to be stopped left and right. So Queen Elizabeth wasn't that a symbol. She was an active participation into what that crown that she had on her head meant, what it meant to sustain the colonization, to sustain the, the, the monarchy as it is, you know, getting all this from its former colonies. I feel like when we try to make Queen Elizabeth a symbol, we are trying to take it away from the sufferings of all these former colonies and also their pain and their realities that they have lived and still continue to live. Because when we talk about colonialism, it isn't what has happened. It's also what continues to happen today, you know, mm -hmm. and the conversations of, 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 of democracy and, and, and the states of African countries right now as relating to what colonialism has done to these states. Jason, on that point, in fact, of, you know, independence movements, right? So um, many would give credit, in fact, Queen Elizabeth, that when she became queen, um, there were a lot more colonies under British rule. But by the time she's passed away, there's a lot less colonies under British rules. And that that's a positive thing, that she's, in fact, ushered in an era of post-colonialism in some ways. That That's argued by many, many people. How do you react to that argument? Um, yes, just to, to respond to what I was saying earlier, I mean, I do think in a contemporary setting, she is perhaps more symbolic and um, the idea of colonialism is perhaps spread over, you know, the choices of our government and, and big corporations and their acts on the continent in terms of neo-colonialism. However, I, I don't think that um, she was solely responsible for, for decolonizing. I mean, that came from countries and, and independence movements are very actively fighting against um, sort of the monarchy and their actions um, on the continent for, for a very long time. And even after gaining independence, um, you know, Zimbabwe, Kenya and Nigeria still retain the Queen as head of state. And that was out of necessity to, to retain the British spirit, sphere of influence, which was necessary for um, trade and, and democratic support. Um, so I, I don't think she should be given sort of credit for, for decolonization and, and for the fact that we, that we have less um, sort of influence. Um, I, I think that was due to many, many sort of organized groups and, and, and fighting and, and uh, that didn't come easy. Yeah, what, what do you make of that, um, Judy Cal? Just the, the issue of independence as you mentioned it. I mean, do you think that um, there is credit there due to the queen that, you know, that she essentially, during her reign, we have had all this, these independence movements of former British colonies? Um, I mean, credit will be given if if countries didn't have to organize, get guns, resist against the British colonial police in their countries, get independence. But they did have to do a lot of organizing. They did have to do a lot of lobbying. They did have to do a lot of ne negotiation with the British Empire. So to say that the Queen deserves even a little credit is to really laugh at the faces of people who died for independence movement. Because we need to acknowledge that 
countries like Zimbabwe, countries like Kenya, independence would, wasn't just granted like that. People fought for it. You know, the Mau Mau Rebellion, as I spoke about, um, the organizing that happened in Zimbabwe with, with, with the people part of the organizing movement in Zimbabwe. So we need to acknowledge that Queen Elizabeth didn't just wake up and say, oh, great, today is a good day for decolonization. I'm just going to grant freedom to these African colonies. No, African colonies fought for it, demanded, lobbied, did all the nego negotiation possible. I mean, look even at South Africa, all the lobbying that organizers had to do for apartheid to end all the organizers they had to do toward the british empire so they can participate and stop the funding of the movement that lobbying the credit goes to the organizers not to the queen and i strongly believe in fact that if african colonies weren't comfortable with colonialism we would still be colonized if we wouldn't have fought for independence we wouldn't have been granted that independence our ancestors our our, our, our organizers, our grand grandfathers had to fight very hard for it. So the Queen doesn't deserve any credit, to be honest. Jason, just under 30 seconds if you can, because we're going to be going into a break very quickly. Um, what do you make of the, the, the issue of the Commonwealth? Do you think that that is a huge positive at this point? Because that's spoken of in very positive terms. Um, I, I do think sort of the idea of working together and, and um, being a, a collection, especially, I mean, after the pandemic is a positive thing, but I do think the history of the Commonwealth has very negative connotations. Um, and sort of, in, if you look at the imbalance of power in terms of um, who's making the decisions and then the influence that the UK government has um, in the Commonwealth, um, you could argue that not every country within the Commonwealth has um, sort of the same, um, the same ability, uh, the same power to speak. Um, and, and that's a huge problem. Um, I, I do think, but however, I do think, you know, working together, setting up more organizations where, where countries are proactively working together in, in an equal way is very, very important. Indeed. Well, we're going to be back right after this break that we're just about to go into. And we're going to discuss after this break a few more issues. And we're going to talk more specifically about things like natural resources, uh, a lot of the jewels, as well as other precious items um, that are right now in control of both the royal family, as well as the British government, British museums, etc., as well as the slave trade. These are already important issues on their own as well. I'm going to put those issues to Judah, Cal, and Jason right after this break. Please do stay tuned for that. Right after this break, I'll be back with Judah, Cal, and Jason. Welcome back, everyone. You're here in the scope with me, Wakar Rizvi, and continue to discuss uh, the issue of colonialism, especially in the wake of Queen Elizabeth's passing and the debate that has now uh, once again sprung up about that issue. And we're still joined by Judicale and Jason, and we're continuing to discuss that topic. Judicale, before I get to the issue of, of natural resources, et cetera, you know, there's an argument that, that um, has popped up in my mind once again that many people refer to, and that is that, in fact, colonization was a positive thing for the colonies in some ways, um, uh, considering they gave them good infrastructure, um, an organized system of governance, et cetera. Uh, what do you make of that argument? Because many people would say that, in fact, um, if, we're, if we look at South Asia, for example, that the governing systems in South Asia, in India, Pakistan, for example, that those are a result of the British empire and that that's not necessarily a bad thing. What do you think of that? Do you know the among the horrible thing that colonialism colonization stole from us one of the most saddest part as a group of people is the ability to evolve on our own i don't think we'll ever have that um, because we had our own ways of living we had our own ways of operating we had our own languages we had our own ways of existing then a group of people deemed that our ways of living were below them and came and took that from us and took that from us after we fought for them to not take it from us. And now we are left having to depend so much on them to even exist. Most African countries depend on curriculum from the West for their schools. Every little thing of our life evolved. Even the language we are talking today is their language. No, colonialism didn't do anything specific to us other than put us on a bubble where our life have to depend on the West. And I strongly believe 
that there is not a single positive aspect of colonialism other than trauma, pain, and constant pain. I don't think, I don't even think as Africans, we understand how hard it is to exist past or to exist after they had said that colonialism has ended. Because today we have lack of collective memory um, as much as our ancestors, our ancestors, our ancestors try to preserve memories of our lives before colonialism, as days go, we lose it. So we have mm. literally lost a little bit of our identity as a group of people because of what colonialism did. So there is not a single positive aspect that can be paid at. So they say that they brought ways of governance. Does it work with the African continent? It does not. Look at us today. We have ethnic groups, we have tribe conflicts, we have a lot of things going on on the continent because we are trying to adopt democracies and way of, of governing that were imposed on us. For God's sake, we didn't even have the police on the African continent, but now we have police brutality on the African continent, while the first police on the African continent came to yeah. colonialism. So no, there's not a single positive aspect. And I'm not trying to say that if we wouldn't have colonized, we would have better ways of living, but at least we would have our ways of living. We would have evolved as a group of people and we would take pride on our own ways of living instead of what we have today, okay. trying so much to decolonize, trying so much to shy away, but still stuck on ways of white supremacy. Uh, Jason, of course, uh, I'd love your thoughts on what Judah Caldera said, but I also wanted to add on this issue of natural resources because I already do want to also give it due attention. And that's an important one where many people would refer to the natural resources that were siphoned off from many of these British colonies or other colonies of other countries too, by the way, French colonies or other colonies as well to those respective countries, which then have enriched them over generations. And that's why we are currently in a global economic situation and class system that we currently see. What are your thoughts on that, Jason? Well, first, I completely agree with her. I think sort of the colonization of the mind, the trauma um, that, 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 that that legacy leaves, whether that's colorism or a lack of representation in politics or media or film or even microaggressions, you know, in your daily life, whether that's the office or a friendship group is extremely toxic. And, and that legacy of colonialism lasts in the global south and in the diaspora. Um, but I do think, as you were saying, in terms of siphoning off natural resources, that today, in today's climate, um, neocolonialism and sort of the impact of, of Western governments and companies on the continent is extremely important um, and needs to be criticised and analysed. And, and all of that needs to be extremely transparent. I mean, Africa will have one of the largest and youngest populations in the very near future. And we're seeing that exploitation happen in real time whether that's from British American Tobacco or Facebook and Google set, setting up moderation centers and exposing um, you know, young African workers to PTSD with very little pay and, and sort of no um, trade unions being able to set up, or even Western energy companies um, so setting up more factories on the continent and the impact of pollution um, and climate change that we're seeing um, when sort of, I think it's 4% of emissions that, that Africa releases in comparison um, to the West, which is significantly more. Um, I think it's very damaging. And I think moving forward, we need a, an extreme sense of transparency and accountability. On the, on the issue of natural resources, Judical, um, why is it that, you know, if we talk about certainly within colonial history and throughout the colonialism, um, that those natural resources were siphoned off why is that still occurring or why are we still seeing the effects of that right like why haven't those former colonies now taken control of the situation and ensured that or ensured their own national interests and their own people's interests what is blocking that from happening do you think i mean dynamics of power um that former colonies exist with um i mean all the eyes we spoke about the commonwealth and what it presents and the Commonwealth as well represent an imbalance of power. And of course, these African countries are decolonized on paper, but when it comes to actual governance, they are not. They rely so much on the West. They rely so much on, on the Commonwealth. They rely so much on loans from the West to operate in their countries. And I also think 
the hardest part is that we also have compliance from our leaders. I'm not trying to take responsibility away from us. Um, we have also our leaders who are corrupted, our leaders who do not have the interest of their countries at heart, that then get to do whatever they have to do for their own personal survival. So it's it's a tricky situation to be to be in as as a continent right now. That's a good point, isn't it, Jason? Um, you know, the fact that there are in many of these former colonies corrupt leaders or corrupt systems of governance, in fact, where it's just it's almost like a hierarchy of just a continuous corruption and, and bad decision making. Is that almost, Jason, in your opinion, like a colonization of the mind, right, where there's almost a self inferiority complex as well on the part of not just leaders, but even people colonized peoples, where they strongly then believe that in some ways that they are lower in some ways than the British or whoever may have colonized them? Well, firstly, I'd like to say that, you know, corruption is everywhere, whether that's as transparent as it is in, I suppose, some nations or other. I, I do think it's present everywhere. However, I do think um, in the global south and on the continent in particular, there's a big uptake in Western culture and a subsequent erasure of African culture and history, which is extremely harmful in the long term. Um, but also, I think in today's society, you know, um, money and money has the power. Um, it's not necessarily about the symbolism or, or that, that imbalance, but we're also seeing, you know, mass exploitation from, from China and from Russia in terms of sort of setting up um, factories and, and very sort of and deals which are very hidden, um, whether that's arms or whether that's natural resources. Um, we're seeing we're still seeing exploitation, but it's not necessarily from from the West or from countries that have previously um, been been colonizers. Um, so I think it's a much more complex situation, and, and I don't think it's necessarily as easy as saying, oh, you know, sort of, sort of the West are better, because um, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Hmm. Uh, Judicall, um, what do you what do you make of the fact that, as as I put to Jason as well, we have many people formerly colonized people who actually have internalized colonization for themselves too, right? And then they sort of regurgitate that back out, right? Where as we, as we, as you already mentioned, we're all speaking English. Um, you know, I'm also of origin from a country such as Pakistan, which was colonized. And um, English, for example, here is in, in Pakistan is seen as this, is as a sign of, you know, upper class, citizens, right? And I imagine that that is the case in many other such former colonies as well. What are your thoughts on that? And just the fact that we continue to then as former colonized people take this system forward, even in our minds? Yeah, so one of the things that colonialism did, um, and especially British colonialism, was to create an upper class that is made of African elites who were pushed that if they do try to live like Britain, um, upper class is living, then they will have the same power as them. So there is that undying urge to speak in good English, to attend the best school, to appear very much closer to a whiteness would deem of, of a person part of upper class. So that is what colonialism did into our mind. It, it created this upper class realities based on what the colonizer, the colonizer would think of us if we were to speak good English or look a certain way. And I feel like Kwame Nkrumah, when he was talking about neo-colonialism, he wrote a very powerful sentence speaking that the, the speaking that 50 years after independence, Africa will be still facing a mental slavery colonialism that would demand a liberated man. And, I, and if you see today what the continent is going through is that is that we are a continent that needs to find its own identity, a continent that needs to find its own Africanness, a continent that needs to decolonize its own mind first. You know, go back to defining what is African, what defines us outside of what the West say should define us as a continent. And that is hard when your entire life depends on the West. It's very hard. Indeed. Well, we'll have to leave there as a final word, but we really, really appreciate both Judical Eric Jose as well as Jason Hunsball for taking their time out. As I said, of their no doubt very busy schedules, especially these days. We we discussed quite a few issues when it came to um, you know how we've all been reflecting ever since Queen Elizabeth's death. Of course, there is a pro and con argument on both sides about her legacy as well as colonialism in general beyond just the British Empire as well. French colonialism, for example, which we didn't discuss in great detail. Nevertheless, we did discuss issues such as 
of the Commonwealth, constitutional monarchy, the colonization of the mind, which I feel is one of the more important issues to be discussed when it comes to colonization as a whole, as well as just natural resources, jewels, for example, as well, which we didn't get to, but on the crowns, etc. Those are really important uh, issues as well. And of course, the slave trade issues that happen in Kenya and Nigeria, especially when we're talking about the African continent. I'll leave it there at that for now, though. But thanks very much for watching this edition of The Scope here on BMTV. Of course, be back next week with another hot topic of the week. Of course, please do send in your comments as well. Thank you for watching.